that's all nice and well, but there are cases where linear classification is not enough. There are cases where we also want to classify non-linearly and um, then it gets a little bit more complicated, but in the end uh, we will also have a lot more powerful classifiers and uh, there are some tricks that can be used to also make non-linear classification easy to work with and efficient. So, first of all, look here at the above uh, picture where we have uh, the red class of elements lying on a circle and the entire thing is embedded in a space and surrounded by all the blue um, examples and uh, it becomes immediately clear that we cannot linearly, linearly separate the two. Um, there are other examples where linear separation is really difficult, for example the so-called uh, XOR problem. Here I have one class um, in two areas and I have, ah no, let me backtrack. Uh, the XOR problem actually could be solved by, by, um, um, by linear classification, um, but I mean what we have here that should be, that should be motivation enough. Uh, so we would like also to have a classifier to exactly separate here the, the blue from the red circles and um, by lifting the entire space into a higher dimension uh, this can actually be found. So this is shown on the, on the lower image. Here we make a nonlinear transformation where in the end all the points they end up on like a bathtub shape and, uh, and then we can run here a uh, um, um, we can have a, a separating hyperplane uh, that perfectly separates the red from the blue uh, dots in, in the three-dimensional space. There's a nice theorem by, by Cover which says that in a complex pattern classification problem uh, when we cast it to a higher dimensional space non-linearly there is a larger likelihood that I can find a perfect linear separation. And, and this is what we are using here. So originally our features, they are in, um, uh, well, let's say our features are in a uh, low dimensional uh, space here, the, the n dimensional uh, vectors of real numbers. And we are mapping that to a very high dimensional space of still of real numbers, Rn. And um, so in principle, we could also have uh, different spaces. For example, we could have uh, all kinds of graphs as input or molecules as input or something like that, uh, which are difficult to represent in Rn. Uh, but for now, consider that all, all our features are our real numbers. Okay. And uh, we want this transformation into the expanded feature space. We want that to be nonlinear. And we also want it to be injective. So what does injective mean? Let's imagine I have here my original space, I'm calling it X, and I have my uh, expanded feature space and I'm calling that H. And uh, when I now take two different examples and map them from the original feature space to the expanded feature space, I want them to end up in two different positions in the expanded feature space. So what doesn't make sense is to, for example, uh, take all my original samples and map that to the same point in a high dimensional space, then I wouldn't help my classifier. So we want it to be a nonlinear transformation though, so that finding the linear separation is helped and uh, we also want it to be an injective mapping. Um, so down here uh, we see two examples. You can imagine many, many different basis expansions that are possible. So this is also a little bit of feature engineering. Um, you can imagine many different types of basis expansion. Here we see uh, two, the polynomial and the Gaussian basis expansion. Um, and uh, later we will see a couple of um, examples that have proven useful and that are used over and over again also in the literature. Okay. Now we can train our perceptron in a non-linear fashion. So again, we have a shorthand for our misclassified samples. And the training algorithm, and it hasn't actually changed a lot. The only thing that changed is that every time we are looking at a feature 
uh, vector from our uh, training data, we first lift that into the higher dimensional space. Uh, we're doing the basis expansion and also our W now. Our W has become larger, so now the W is in Rm. And before that, it was in Rn. Uh, and so also here we do the expansion. And then when we do the classification, uh, we want to classify a new example, then again, we need to expand the training example, the, the test sample into the high dimensional space, multiply it by uh, the, the weights W and add the offset. Okay. Well, this algorithm that you see here is actually working uh, nicely and as expected. And if we had infinite computational time and resources available, then uh, that we could, we could end here. Uh, the problem is that we don't have infinite time and computational resources, and uh, we would quickly run into problems. So before neural networks, um, all kinds of different classifiers were used, for example, on the MNIST dataset, and uh, also the Perceptron and later the SVM were also applied on the MNIST dataset. And there, the features that are available to us are essentially a 28 by 28 grayscale image for every little number in handwriting. Uh, so here we select one of these numbers and we have a 28 by 28 image in grayscale and uh, we want to use that for classification. Now, if we were to, uh, for example, use the polynomial basis expansion, this would blow up immediately from 28 by 28 to, how much is that? Over uh, three or 300,000 uh, parameters uh, or features for a single um, 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 handwritten number. Uh, and that would be not efficient at all. Uh, so we, we, we cannot work with that. And especially back in the 80s and 90s, people were not able to, to work with uh, dimensionalities that were that high. So what can be done is to reduce the dimensionality. Uh, to say, um, I take the number and I'm counting the number of black pixels in the upper left quadrant or something like that to get to a lower dimensional uh, description or uh, feature vector and then I can do the, the lifting. Um, but there's even a, a better way and uh, the better way is called a kernel. And the kernel allows us to use exactly the classification in a very high dimensional feature space without having to compute the, the full vector there. Okay. Um, but before we can apply the kernel, we have to modify our Perceptron algorithm and um, write it down in a dual fashion. The term dual is heavily, heavily overloaded in computer science. So the dual Perceptron, it has nothing to do with the Lagrangian dual, uh, but still it's an established term and therefore we are using it here. Now, before we had a big feature vector um, or a big weights vector W, and uh, we were updating that in every iteration. And uh, now we don't have that any longer. Now what we do instead is we count for each of the training samples how often we were using that particular training sample in order to find a uh, linear classifier that perfectly separates our decision boundaries. And so here we have our alpha and the uh, alpha is essentially it's a big vector yeah, and it contains um, natural numbers that are essentially a count for how often I use the first sample, for how often I use the second sample, how often I use the third sample, and so on. And um, when, we then, um, um, when we then encounter a misclassified sample, we are just increasing the counter here. Yeah? So we are just increasing the counter here, do nothing else, and therefore we are no longer in Rm, but this alpha this alpha is actually in Rd. This is element of Rd, where D is the size of the training data set. Okay, and uh, now for the shorthand of misclassified samples, um, uh, well, this has become a little bit more complicated, 
because essentially what we have here is we reconstruct in every step our w. The w is the the well the the the, uh, the weights vector, and also when we now um, classify every example here again we have our w uh, reconstructed. So in this formulation, it's not very helpful to be using this uh, idea of, of counting the training samples. Um, however, this will enable us some further simplifications in the future. Okay, um, now we come to the kernel trick. The kernel trick says that we have a polynomial basis expansion first. And then we put this polynomial basis expansion into an inner product. So here we have our uh, phi and um, we first expand therefore in the higher dimensional uh, basis and then plug the entire thing into uh, this inner product here. Yeah? So before, before we had just written x transposed uh, y uh, so this is the, 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 the Euclidean inner product, uh, but in general, and now we generalize a little bit, in general we can be also in other Hilbert spaces where we have uh, uh, different inner products and uh, therefore we now write it in the general way. And the big insight is that instead of first expanding everything into a very, very high dimensional feature space and then compressing everything um, into a, a single scalar, we can take a shortcut. Um, let's look at a very small example. Let's look at one particular kernel uh, based on uh, well expanding to the polynomials. Uh, so we here have uh, first of all an expansion into a basis that instead of a1 and a2 uses a1 squared um, then um, the square root of a1 times a2 and then a2 squared. So this which has to be a squared and this also has to be a squared. Okay. And now I can um, use the, the Euclidean inner product um, uh, for the two, end up with a formula and so on, and then I can simplify um, in the end. And in the end I end up with a transpose b squared. Now for just having two vectors, this is not yet a big improvement. However, you have to imagine what happens when I am in when I have say a hundred features in my original space. When I then do the polynomial expansion and I consider every feature squared, but also the multiplication of any combination of two features, then it becomes very very high dimensional. But still, in the end, I can compress everything down to a formula of this shape, yeah? and therefore by considering the basis expansion immediately together with an inner product, I sometimes find shortcuts where I don't have to do all the computation and uh, I immediately uh, uh, take the shortcut. And uh, there are even cases where I'm only looking then at the kernel and from looking at the kernel I can infer that there exists some high dimensional basis expansion with an inner product, but I don't actually care that much. And there are even cases where the uh, basis expansion would have to be infinite dimensional. Yeah? Where I know there exists a basis expansion with an inner product that gives me the kernel, but it would be infinite dimensional. I couldn't actually work with that in a computer, but the kernel actually immediately tells me what the shortcut is and, and this is then more and more efficient to, to evaluate. Okay, so um, here's a picture to explain this. I can either go from the original feature space by the basis expansion to Rm and compress it back down or immediately I take the root, the shortcut of the kernel function. And um, the, for the kernel function, we will be a little bit more formal about what the kernel is in the section on reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces. Um, here we only consider the kernel function to be symmetric and um, well there are well-known kernels and in many cases what you do in practice um, you, you, you take one existing kernel that you know that is well performing and maybe has the properties you're looking for. So the linear kernel 
uh, that's pretty obvious. Uh, the polynomial kernel is what we just saw with the extension here of um, some, 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 some scalar C. Um, but there are also things like the RBF kernel. Uh, this basically has the shape of a, um, you, of a, of a Gaussian and uh, well, uh, it gives me a distance measure essentially uh, between, between two samples. There are other popular kernels. We cannot have a full list here. Um, 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 but uh, this is just for you to understand um, why the kernel is advantageous and why we want to bring everything in a form where it can be kernelized. Right? And the whole business of writing down the dual version of the Perceptron algorithm was only to be able to kernelize it. Right? So. Um, if we look at the original dual version here of the perceptron algorithm, what we see is that the basis expansion is only used for our feature vectors from the data. So here we have the basis expansion. In every case, the feature expansion is for some data element. And what we don't do is feature expansion, for example, of, 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 of W, big W. Uh, this is what we what we want to avoid. And uh, before doing the dualization, we had a term um, that said uh, um, W transpose times X. That is difficult to lift in a higher dimensional uh, space. But uh, now um, in the dualized form, we only have um, the um, we have only the, the, the features from the actual data being uh, put into the basis expansion. And now we can use that uh, because now uh, we can uh, transform this a little further in such a way that um, um, I only have here immediately uh, the inner product of two of these uh, basis expansions, and I can replace that with a kernel. Okay. So um, he, um, originally we had um, um, an inner product that looked a little bit more complicated, but just by looking at the axioms of the inner product, we know that we can pull out here the sum and the alpha j and the lj. Um, and um, well, this then uh, results in, in a form that can be kernelized. And uh, we have done that on the left-hand side. Here again, we have our gamma, which tells us which are the misclassified samples. Um, and uh, not much else has changed. Um, the only difference is that now in no place do we require to explicitly write down the expanded feature space that might be really, really difficult to work with. Okay, so victory. We are using nonlinear um, expansion. But we don't actually have to write down the expanded feature vector, uh, and hence we can do nonlinear classification efficiently or more efficiently. Um, what now? Uh, so what what is next? So we could work on uh, ending the duality gap, or we could work on uh, freeing all the variables, or we could uh, ban genetic algorithms, or we could try to support all the vector machines. Well, let's let's try that. Uh, so let's pick that and uh, see whether we can also kernelize the support vector machine so uh, that uh, we can uh, well use nonlinear classification in an efficient way and um, have the advantage to uh, maximize or to robustify the the distance uh, from the data to the decision boundary and also to not be depending on the order of the data in our training samples. Okay, so in order to kernelize the support vector machine, we also first have to dualize that. Yeah? But this dual, it is now back the Lagrangian dual that we are used to. And uh, so we have the primal SVM problem, as it was uh, stated uh, a couple of slides prior. And uh, well, we know how to uh, make the Lagrangian dual of that. We are inventing an additional Lagrangian multiplier. Here it's a vector and have this added term um, for our uh, inequality constraints. 
uh, we have to also transform that a little bit because for the inequality constraints we want this to be gi of x smaller or equal to zero so we translate a little bit and and get up with this formulation okay and uh, here again we would like to kernelize but we don't want to use the uh, basis expansion for um, w uh, so we want we don't want to see this w at all actually and um, now by working with the Lagrangian dual um, we can simplify um, and get rid of this w so first of all um, for the Lagrangian we know that we are looking for a settle point so we can derive by uh, e and we can also derive by w and we know that the result should be zero or should be the zero vector in the settle point and um, this gives us two interesting things for example we will know that mu transpose l should be zero and here l i consider that to be the the vector the column vector of all the uh, the labels of all the training data and um, uh, and um, the other thing is i know that i want to have w equal to this sum over here um, Okay, and um, um, this we can plug in. Uh, so this we can plug in back into the original dual. And uh, now there are a couple of technical steps that we will not completely show on the slides and that are also not relevant for the exam. But after some technical steps, I can simplify the Lagrangian by plugging in these two results. And uh, we will see that in the end, um, um, the Lagrangian in the saddle point is independent from W and B. Yeah? So in general, the Lagrangian it depends on W and B because there are also here arguments of the Lagrangian. However, in the saddle point, when I have arrived at the saddle point, then the value of the Lagrangian um, will be independent of W and B if I consider the, these, uh, these previous um, insights. Uh, and uh, so here um, I have a new Lagrangian uh, that is in the saddle point only depending on mu. And that's great because um, I uh, can now simplify the definition of the Lagrangian dual. Uh, so this is the original Lagrangian dual. And now I can uh, just uh, leave out the, the infimum part because I know the entire thing is independent from W and B. Uh, but I still need to consider these constraints. Yeah? So these two constraints here, are, or particularly this constraint here, I still have to keep that in mind uh, when I am selecting my mu. Yeah? So now I still have the freedom to selecting the mu. So now I'm doing here the maximization of q and q over mu. And here I need to consider um, two constraints. The first constraint is, is that mu has to be larger than zero because it's uh, for inequality constraints and the second one is that I need to have mu transposed L equal to zero. Okay. Now this is actually the entire magic. Huh? So this is the definition of the hard margin SVM in the dual form and uh, because we have strong duality uh, we can show that uh, this gives me um, uh, uh, perfect results. I don't have a duality gap here. And uh, we can simplify a little more. We can simplify by putting this expression here as a big um, square matrix multiplication. So uh, we, we make a, a matrix that is actually a symmetric matrix and the objective function, it simplifies to that. So uh, we know how to solve uh, quadratic optimization problems. Also the two uh, constraints that we have here, they don't uh, bother us that much. We only have to ensure that the matrix K is, um, is semi-definite or positive semi-definite. And uh, that we have to check. Sometimes also a matrix is positive semi-definite, but uh, for numerical issues, well, we can show that the matrix is positive semi-definite by looking at the eigenvalues and especially the, the smallest of the eigenvalues. And that has to be positive. But sometimes the smallest eigenvalue is really small, it's close to zero, 
but then with numerical issues ends up on the negative side so it's uh, minus 1 to the power of negative 15 or something like that and then some of the algorithms will reject this uh, matrix K uh, so sometimes we have to nudge that a little bit help it a little bit um, but um, um, well, in general, when we have uh, this matrix K and, and everything is numerically precise, then we just verify it's uh, positive uh, semi-definite. And then we know that the entire thing here is uh, a convex optimization problem. Yeah? Because here um, I have something um, convex that I'm minimizing, but uh, or here I have negative some convex term but since i'm maximizing the whole thing works out fine and uh, this is uh, an optimization problem that we already know how to solve okay. now um, and this now is also a version of the optimization problem that we can kernelize because here we only have inner products between the uh, data samples or the, the the feature vectors from our samples and uh, so the only thing that we need to change in order to switch from a linear classification problem to a nonlinear classification problem is we plug in our, um, our kernel function when we compute this uh, symmetric matrix K here. Yeah? So this is the only place where we need to be adding something. Yeah? And then we get back um, our uh, results, which are the mu. And um, the mu are then actually the support vectors because there are only a couple of these mu, every mu corresponds to one sample and only a couple of these mu will be positive and all the other ones will be zero. And uh, we now only need to consider the positive mu when we are doing the actual um, classification of a new sample that, that we get in. Yeah, therefore, it's efficient, so it's, effic it's good to kernelize. That is efficiency for nonlinear classification. And once we have that result, it's efficient to evaluate because we only need to consider uh, a, a small subset of the samples that are actually impacting us in the, um, uh, with uh, the, the, the support vectors that are closest to the decision boundary. Yeah. And uh, here we can reconstruct the original um, uh, term inner product of w and uh, epsilon uh, which uh, and y which would uh, here also receive then the, the um, basis expansion if we choose to or then we would have for the basis expansion here we would have a very high dimensional um, w which we don't want to have i'm calling it w prime and here we would have the basis expansion of y and uh, this is essentially what we would get um, and uh, by, by kernelizing we can have exactly the same effect okay and then also the b can be reconstructed and actually i can reconstruct the b from only one of the support vectors however here i sum and then average uh, also because numerically it's a little bit more stable to, to do that. Okay, how does this help us? Um, now we have uh, the kernel SVM and we have seen a couple of kernels. Um, let's choose two different types of iris. Now we have iris versicolor and iris virginica and uh, we have the raw data that appears in the paper of, uh, of uh, Fischer from 1936. But by selecting these two species of iris, we will see that they are much closer to one another and uh, we would not be able to find a linear classification that perfectly separates the two classes. So we go for nonlinear classification and here we choose an RBF kernel with a sigma, which is a hyperparameter for the kernel, uh, sigma equals to one. And uh, by plugging everything in and solving the convex optimization problem from the previous slide, uh, we get out a, a classifier that perfectly classifies between the two. And here it, it gets a little bit complicated in the middle when the, when the two classes nearly intersect. Um, so here the, the decision boundary, so the boundary where we have here exactly zero when we plug everything into the decision formula. Um, this becomes more complicated 
um, with a soft margin SVM, which we haven't shown here, we can have additional parameters to fiddle with where we can um, have a trade-off between having a, 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 a simpler uh, decision boundary and we, we make the trade-off with a couple of um, misclassified uh, training samples. Okay, um, that's it. So now you know how the SVM works and with the tools made available in the lecture, you know how to construct uh, a, the training algorithm for the SVM really from scratch and to apply that and uh, make it also uh, efficient. And uh, actually uh, it is not much different from the big machine learning packages that you would normally use. Now you uh, are able to, to do that from scratch and to some extent we are also doing that in the, in the exercise. Okay, this brings us to the last section on reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces.